God didn't do it. So don't go to sleep during church to make up for that hour. <laughs> oh, I mean to tell you, only God's in charge of time. <laughs> You're just looking mighty good today, though. I'm glad to see you in church on Daylight Savings Time Sunday. In fact, uh, everybody raise your right hand like this. Give yourself a pat on the back from Brother Joe. All right. <laughs> That's your pat on the back for today. Let's see, Terry Acker's texting me, should I check it or not? So. Oh, Terry says, will do. That's the kind of attitude we need, amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord, we need a will do attitude every time. Speaking of will do attitudes, uh, there it is, that'll do. We're in our sermon series in, called Higher. We started last Sunday about taking it to the next level in our spiritual life. If you were here last Sunday, we started the sermon and we ended the sermon with four questions. One was, where am I right now in my faith walk? My relationship to Christ, relationship, can, I, can I be honest about my uh, personal inventory? Where am I? Number two question was, where am I headed in this walk of faith? What's the goal? Where's God taking me? Where am I headed? Yeah, and the third one was, you know, what's hindering me? What's in the way? What's keeping me from being where God wants me to be in my life right now? And the fourth was, what steps do I need to take to get there? And we'll look at those every Sunday because they're all relevant to this whole particular series of messages. You know, where am I? Now, last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 11. And we kind of called it the, the, the hall of fame of faith. Uh, I call it the hall of the faithful. We looked at in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and saw those motivations, what it was that, uh, that, in, that was going on in those people's hearts and lives where it gets down in Hebrews 11 where it says, and therefore God was not ashamed to be called their God. There's not one of us, I think, that wants to live with a kind of title of our lives as God's ashamed. No, that God's pleased, God's, God's excited. Of course, the message of Hebrews 11 was a faith life. Uh, faith, what pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We just finished a whole series talking about faith and action from the book of James, seven sermons on, you know, if we are children of God, what's going on in our life? What's God doing in our life? That's a demonstration of it because in a nutshell, faith without works is what? It's dead. The last thing we need to be is dead. We have a ground rule around here, if you're new, it's called don't be dead, amen? If you, you know, the Bible tells us, you know, that the dead praise not the Lord. So if you're not praising the Lord, that kind of gives yourself away. So don't be dead, be alive. But what we're going to look at today, as we looked last week and saw it was a group of people driven by passion for God and their belief and their faith in Christ, there's another kind of what I call hall of faithful that often gets overlooked. It's in Romans chapter 16. There's about 12 verses there. Paul is finalizing Romans chapter, uh, this letter to the Romans in chapter 16. It deals with some more heroes, uh, some more what you call the faithful in Christ. I want us to look briefly at them, and then I want to jump into the challenge of where we are and where we're headed and what God's doing in our life and talk about investing our lives, all right? But if you look in Romans chapter 16, it starts off with this woman by the name of Phoebe. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. She's a servant of Christ, which is at Centria. That you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and you help her in whatever matters she may have need of you. That's a pretty broad invitation there, amen? Why? Because she herself has been a helper of many and of myself as well. <coughs> Greet Prissa and Aquila, he goes on to say, my fellow workers Christ, who for my life have risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that's in their house and greet Epinitus, my beloved, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, she has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. And then greet Ampliatus, who, who is my beloved in the Lord. And greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Statius, my beloved. And greet Apelles, the approved of Christ. Greet those who are the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who is in the Lord. Greet Trephania and Trophosia, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. I am hoping that if somebody's writing a letter to the church at Believer's Fellowship, that they're commending us, amen, 
that somewhere in the blanks where they fill in the name parts, your name is found there. And I believe there's a lot of people in our, our church whose names could fall in there. And there's a lot more whose names wouldn't be mentioned in there. And he just talks about these people. In fact, he mentions Phoebe, who is a servant of Christ. In fact, that word servant is the word that we get our, another word in the male version for deacon. A servant of Christ. He says, this woman, Phoebe, she is a servant of the church, and she has been a helper. This word in the King James, they may even say shuker, or a woman who has set over others. In fact, this word in the Greek language was also a title given, this word for helper. It was also used in a, in a proper sense of a woman who would be given authority as a guardian over certain groups of people within the Grecian government. They, she'd have an official role that would be assigned to her that she was kind of like the... Uh, uh, a guard and, and a protector and, and a provider making sure that whatever this group was that was under her, she was making sure they were taken care of, they were fed, their, their needs were met. And he said, this is, this is what Phoebe is. She, she's that kind of person who cares about everybody else. In fact, he says, take note of this woman and help her. In, well, this is a big term. In any way she needs it. Now, folks, we have some of these Phoebes in our church. And they are in need at different times for different situations and different things. Sometimes they're over in the children's ministry. Sometimes they're in the nursery. Sometimes they're greeting. Sometimes they're, you know, their husband's a lift leader. Sometimes they're, they're involved in some area, teaching a Bible study, women's ministry. Make, take note of the Phoebes in our fellowship. But don't just take note and say, oh, pat on the back. Help them in whatever they ask you to help them with. Am I preaching too fast again? <laughs> I'm really trying to slow down for those of us who are slow to listen. Amen? Then he talks about Prissa and, and, and Aquila. This is Priscilla and Aquila, may say in your translation. He says, they're my fellow workers who risk their own necks. The Greek word there is synergos, and it means <coughs> companion in work. And the word ergo here, it means like this is, they, they work. It, it's a deed that has to be done. The idea of work, when they use this word in the Greek language of ergon, the idea of working is emphasized, all right? They weren't just his companions and his fellow workers. How many of y'all have fellow workers? Let me finish the sentence before you answer. How many have fellow workers that are more like fellows and not workers? Now, we've all worked with those kind of people, amen? They're there, they're pulling a check, but we don't know about that work part of it. They're fellows, but they're not necessarily fellow workers. That's not what he's saying about Priscilla and Aquila, and we see a lot of them in the New Testament and see what they did. But he says that they, you know, they are so committed to what God's called them to do in ministry that they put their own, they risk their own necks. They put their lives on the line. And then he talks about Mary, and I love what he says, just, just Mary, she's worked hard for you. She worked hard for you. And if you were doing a little Greek dictionary look up, that, that's that word for toiling, hard, rigorous labor, kapoias. And it has to do with, you know, really getting out and breaking a sweat. In fact, it says she worked much is one translation. And the word in the Greek language is, 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 is poulos, which means she did a, an abundant amount of stuff for you. But isn't that what ministry is? Isn't that what ministry is? Working hard for other people? And then he says, while we're at it, he says, and remember Urbanus, he's also our fellow worker. That's that word ergon again. It's the same as Aquila and Priscilla. The idea here, but this kind of worker, though, is it's somebody who goes out from somewhere to do the work. This is the cold context of this, of this word in the Greek language is that they went somewhere to work. He said, they're traveling with me. Like Priscilla and Aquila, they're, they're, they're beside me. They have left something. It costs them to go with me. It costs them to do this kind of work that they're doing. So you salute Abernus because he's a fellow worker. And I love this guy, Pels. So I'd love to meet him. I, well, we will one day, amen. It says, <laughs> what Paul says, approved in Christ. And that's that word for approval that was used to, uh, for, for, for d determining the genuine weight. Like if they had a coin, a silver coin, uh, it had to weigh a certain amount, all right, to be official as a coin. But what some of the money changers and people who work with the, in the monetary system is they would do uh, a practice known as shaving. They'd shave the coins, a little bit of silver off this, a little bit of gold off this, you know, and then they'd come up with some more silver and gold. They, then if they did that, the coin was not really qualified, all right? It didn't meet the actual standard. He says, this guy, Pels, he's the real deal. We have some people like that in our family. They're the real deal. I mean, they're not, they're not just blowing smoke. They're, they're the real thing. Now, let's approved in Christ. I mean, who approved him? 
I mean, he's been tested, he's been tried, he's been weighed, he's found out to be the real thing. He's the genuine, genuine article. He's approved in Christ. This guy, it's, it's, he, he means business. What he says, you can, you can take it for what he says. I mean, he means what he says, he says what he means. He's all business when it comes to Jesus. Approved in Christ. It's not something he does on Sunday. It's not something he tacks on to his spiritual life. He, he, it's like, you know, he's FDA approved. <laughs> The Father's determining approval, all right? We, we, we look at everything, was it FDA approved? I'm buying some meat, I want to be FDA approved. I'm buying, I'm buying pharmaceutical drugs from my heart, I want to be FDA approved. I'm buying something that's not approved. This guy was the real deal, that's what he says about him. And then he talks about another workers, or two here, Trophania and Trophosa, workers in the Lord. And it's that same word in verse six about kopea, kopea, which means to grow tired with toil. But I like how he tags on it, it was in Christ. In Christ. And by the way, you may grow tired from hard toil and be burnt out, or you can grow tired from hard toil in Christ and still be energized. There's a good tired, good tired because you know something was accomplished, good tired because you know it was worthwhile, good tired because it was meaningful and it had something to do with, 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 with something that was of value. This was these guys. And again, it's that, that, that word was used attached to that word for, uh, about working hard a lot. Now, we just, we just mentioned a, a few of these, and Persis, who's worked hard in the Lord, too, like Mary, Trephana, Trephosa. Let me ask you this question. If you ever just stop and say, I wonder what they did. A lot of work going on here, but what are they doing? I don't think it's all really much different from what we're supposed to be doing. They're winning people to Jesus. They're ministering in the body of Christ because over and over this passage, this church is mentioned three or four times. Saints are mentioned a couple times. It was all within the context of the body of Christ. They're doing something for Jesus. They're working hard. I wonder, can our name be written in anywhere in here where it says, and there's Joe, say hi to Joe for me because he's working hard for Lord, the Lord. Can we put our name there? He's, yeah, she's, she's, she's a Mary, she's a Phoebe. She's a, she's, Whatever. What they do? Well, I believe that when the fellowship is coming together, they're meeting the needs. I believe, you know, they're preparing the house. We're going to meet, and I believe they're cleaning up after the saints left. I, I believe they're they're tending some of their children, and taking care of their babies while they're being ministered to, and changing the dirty diapers. I believe they're ministering to the children, to the teen. I believe they're all serving the Lord in some capacity. They're finding their place to plug in and make a difference for people. This, that's what they're doing. I mean, what else were they? They're not building buildings, obviously, at this point. They're serving wherever service can be found. Whatever can be done. Taking ownership, guardianship, providing. And every Christian, every child of God is supposed to be doing pretty much the same thing. And so here's Paul. He's giving these commendations, and they're serving in such a way that it's described like tiring and hard, and rigorous, and in the Lord. And if we look at this whole idea of taking it higher and taking it to the next step, then we need to look at people like this, because these are people out there on the front lines. Look at Hebrews 11, those are people on the front lines. Am I on the front line? Are you on the front line? You know, this is where we get down to, to looking at these lies and then looking at ourselves. If we don't look at ourselves, then we're like James said when our, in our study, you know, you look in the mirror, see what man and person you are, and forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> people look at these people and they say, man, you know, and they, and they kind of shake their and say, man, what a sacrifice. And, uh, like I said last Sunday, we admire sacrifice when we see it in others, don't we? But it's supposed to be in all of us. Present your body a living sacrifice. But let me say this. If you ask them today where they're sitting in heaven with the saints and with the Father, they're not looking at it as a sacrifice. They're looking at it as an investment. An investment with eternal dividends. An investment that pays off. And by the way, these are not pre-cross Christians. These are post-cross Christians. These are post-cross Christians in the midst of tribulation and, ter and persecution and difficulty and trials. These are people who are being sought out and sought after, and they're still standing up, and their names are being recognized by those in the community. Unafraid, unashamed to go forward. We make investments in our life. Now, I told Kathy last night before I got to preach this sermon this morning, I said, let me know between campuses if that was a total disaster or not, and I'll preach a different sermon. 
So what are you talking about? I said, I'm going to take two texts this morning. There's going to be two texts this morning. That was number one. That was part A. Part A leads us, leaves us with this, 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 this thing about if their life was an investment, are there any investments in my life? What, as a Christian, am I doing? We see what they were doing. We read last week what those people did and what drove them and what motivated them. We look at these people and see what they're doing, and they're doing things for Christ and for the body of Christ and for the church. And what am I doing? Because every one of us are either looking and making eternal investments or we're not. So it gets down to, to a simple thing. If I'm going to go higher, then I need to understand some principles about investing my life. And quit looking at it as sacrifice and realize what it is. It's commitments that are eternal investments that pay eternal dividends. There's about three things you can do with your life. One, you can waste it, and that, that's what a lot of people do. They kind of live with the idea, well, you only go around once in a life, grab for the gusto, get as much as you can, party life, and do the thing, and it's all about them. And then there's those who you, you can spend your life, you know? They spend it on career, they spend it on family, they spend it on making a name for themselves, they spend it on building something around themselves, and you can spend your life in a lot of different ways, and some might be noble even, but are they eternal? The third thing you can do is you can invest your life. At the end of your life, all right, by the way, there will be one in this physical sense. You, you, you're probably not going to win the lottery, but you are going to die. <laughs> all right? I, I can't tell you how it's going to work with the lottery. That's why I don't waste my time with it. But I can tell you one thing. Outside the rapture, every one of us is going to die. But that's not the end we know as Christians. We know that at the end we stand before the Lord, you know, and at the end, how am I going to determine if my life meant anything? How am I going to determine if my life was worthwhile? It'll get back to me looking back over my life and saying, what kind of investments did I make? Did my, did my life count? Did my life make a difference? Or was I focused on all the wrong things? Name for myself, popularity, acceptance from the group, pleasure, experiences that I have in life. So... I want to go to this little text here in Matthew 25 as we wrap this up and talk about investing our life. And investing our life, not just to invest it here, but investing our life in things that will outlast our lives. Things that will go on into eternity. Jesus talked about laying yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust does not corrupt. Well, in Matthew 25, he says, it's just like the man about to go on a journey. And let me pause right there. Jesus is sharing this right before the cross. He's not up in the early parables. This is right before the cross. He's saying, okay, guys, let me tell you something very important. Get this lesson. Because it's about a man to go on a journey. Why? Because he just told me, I'm getting ready to go. Share before this parable of ten virgins. This is this. The next thing that happens is, Lord, you know, is they go to the upper room and you know, on to the cross. You know? Hey, it's like a man who, 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 who went on a journey, trusted his possession to them, to one who gave five talents, to another two, and to another, each according to his ability. They went on this journey. Immediately the one who had received five talents went and traded with them, gained five talents more. In the same manner, the one with two talents, he went out and, and, and gained two more talents. But he received the one talent, went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So he's preparing them. He's getting ready to go on a long journey. His presence by the Holy Spirit, but he's giving them, I think, some important principles about a life that's going to mean something and investing their lives. This is about more than about money, all right? Some people say, well, you're going to talk about money. It's a talents. Because that's the literal translation of the word here for talents. Is, is it has to do with, it was, a, it, was a, it was money, all right? And literally, if you took it today, you would read this. And if Jesus was giving us this parable right now, with the economic system we have, he'd say something like, to one he gave 10000 to another 1000 and to another $1,000. Probably even be higher than that today because it was about 1000 back then a talent was. So it would probably be like 10000 or 100000 But he gave them the way, and he said, I'm going on a long journey. Take care of this and handle it properly. Every one of us have been blessed by God. And we're responsible to God. And it falls right in the parameter of this. So I, I'm going to give you seven principles. All right? Just a couple minutes on each one of them. But if you'll take these to heart and receive what God has for you this morning, I believe you'll be able to take it to the next step in your spiritual walk in life. To realize that we're not talking about sacrifices and service. We're talking about investments with our life. You know, and people look at responsibilities within the body of Christ, within the church, within the kingdom. They just got it all wrong. 
These are blessings that God gives us and we have an opportunity to honor God with in our life or dishonor the Lord with. And so he's telling the disciples before he leaves, here's what I want you to get. And, and, and there's seven things I kind of drawn out of this and made very simple statements with. Them. If we're going to invest our life and invest in things that will outlast us, principle number one is, first of all, I accept God's authority over all. Remember, he's the master and he calls the servants together. Jesus is Lord. Let me say that again. Jesus is Lord. What's that mean? That means he's Lord. That means he's the boss. That means he's the king. That means he's the master over all things. That the earth is his, the, the, everything in the earth is his, everything under the earth, you're his. This building's his, your shoes are his, your clothes are his, your house is his, your job is his, your boss is his, all the money in the world is his, all the gold in all the mines, all the diamonds, all the, it all belongs to God. And at the end, he's just going to burn it up. He's the Lord. Psalms 24, we know it perfectly clear. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns it all. Every bit of it. So what about me? He loans me certain parts of it. For however, if I live 50 years, 60 years, 70, 80, 90, 100, however long I'm here, I am supposed to use what God has given me and handle it in a way that will honor him and bring glory to him. If you have any doubt, go back to Genesis 2. You see a kind of a simple principle that says God created man, Adam and Eve, put him in the garden. Told me to work it. Take responsibility over it. Take care of it. Tend it. Now, God's put you in whatever garden. It might not be Eden. Most likely it be since the fall, all right? But we've been placed in certain places, in certain areas, in certain families, in certain strategic places where we work, in the school you're in. It's not by accident. God put you there. Why? Because he's, he owns everything. He's in charge over all things. Everything belongs to God. So now it gets down to this. If it's all God's, then what am I here for? I'm here to manage it. I'm here just to do with it whatever he tells me to do with it. This is the same thing he said in this, this principle. He says, he says uh, again, it would be like a, a man going on a journey called his servants. He's the master. He entrusted his property to them. Whose money is it that he put in their hands? And what's he going to do with it? He's going to come back and get it later. You're responsible for doing something. So the second point of this is, first of all, he's the Lord of it. Second, I have to take responsibility for whatever those gifts are. God has given me talents. Now this, again, is a term for, for money and about a thousand bucks then. But this story's been told for 2,000 years, remember? So we try to take the word talents and apply it to sometimes our artistic skills or abilities or gifts that we might have or leanings. And, but the idea here is, is, is pretty general. Anyway, he's talking about money, but he's talking about everything. Anything the Lord gives us, we're responsible for. There's actually even different varieties of talents. You can get into abilities or resources or opportunities. Those could all be considered talents. Your, your, your abilities, your, your time, your, the money. All three of these things, whatever it is, time, talent, or treasure that you have in your life, you didn't give them to yourself. You may think you did, but all these things are a trust from God to you. Well, I don't have much. Well, some had more than others. It says he'll give you what he can trust you with and he wants you to do something with it. But what I want you to get from this is when it says, I take responsibility for my guess, it means if you follow the story, there are no, no talent people here. Every one of us have been given a measure of faith. So I, I don't have an excuse, first of all. I guess that's what it gets down to. Even Paul said, as he wrote the Roman church a few chapters before 16, he says, you know, uh, you know we, all have, we all have gifts that differ according to the grace of God given us. So every one of us in this room, I mean, just kind of take a mental picture, look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, God's given me some stuff. He's given me some talents, given me some abilities. Give me some, some things in my life. And some get 10, some get 5, some get 2, some get 1, whatever it might be. The idea is there's nobody without any. And everybody's unique, and God wants us to use it, so I have to take responsibility. Third thing, why? Because I realize I am accountable to God. This has to do with obligations. God expects me to put into use what he's given me. He's made an investment in me. He's made an investment in you, and he expects some returns. Verse 19 says, after a long time, the master of these servants returned. Uh-oh. He just turns and says, hey, Jesus is here. 
He's returning to settle accounts. Y'all might circle that term in Scripture, settling accounts. Some of you who, you know, keep your own checkbook, you know what that means? You may work as a, an auditor, you may work as an accountant, you know exactly what that means. But when, what he's saying at the end here, folks, it's not the IRS you should be concerned about. If you're concerned about God, the IRS is no big deal. You'll settle your accounts properly. It's God we need to be concerned about. Because we're all going to have to come and settle accounts. You say, well, what's going to happen? Well, Romans 12 says each of us will give an account to God. Romans 14, 12. What's going to happen? God's just simply going to ask a question at that audit. You know, what would you do with what I gave you? Now, he knows what he did, but we're going to have to give the account. He knew exactly what these, 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 these guys had done with it. But now it's, a, it's a, an opportunity, our responsibility, for us to get up and say, here's what I did with what you gave me. So I have to realize, and this, this will help me make the proper investments when I realize my accountability to God. If there's any fear of God, if there's any love for Christ, then certainly this will weigh into the whole picture of my responsibility and my obligations. The fourth thing in, this, in, in the, these seven things is, I must use what God gives me. To get something out of this, it's, it's wrong to bury your talent. It's wrong to hide it. It's wrong to just put it out of sight and out of mind. If I don't do what God's called me to do, if I don't use what God's given me to use, it's sin. And it is wrong. And I'm not right with God. It's just wrong not to use what God's given me. You notice that the three different servants in the story, he says, he says the first one, he gave five talents. He went out and put money to work. He gained five more. You know, that's a pretty good percentage. All right, that's a good investment. He did something with it. The second guy, two talents. He also went out, put it to use. He gained two more talents. He doubled his money. He got 100% return. That's pretty good. And God's pleased with that. But the third man... The man who just received one talent dug a hole, put his money in it, and hid it. I'm going to have it when the master comes back. I'm just happy I didn't lose it. I know right where it is. Nothing venture, nothing gained. But I don't have to venture. Matt put this guy under the, I'm cautious and I'm conservative group. And there's people in the church like that. But notice what the, the master says to him. He says, in verse 26 and 27, he kind of gives it, the auditor is giving the report and says, you wicked and lazy servant. Now, it would be foolish for us to preach something like this and not take an account of where we are personally. And we just kept going back to those questions. Where am I? Where am I headed? What's stopping me? The last thing any of us ever want to hear is to stand before the Lord on that day, not hear well, what, coming to the joy of the Lord, but hear the other. You wicked and lazy servant. You, you, you thought you knew me. You had no idea what I'm like. In fact, he just said, well, I knew what kind of man you were. I know you said you did, yada, yada, yada. And he, he, you, know, said, you didn't know anything. You thought you knew me. Here's the point with this guy. He didn't even try. I mean, to go out and try and lose it and fail, that had been better than to come up with a thousand talents to say, here's my money at the end. I believe the master would have been more pleased if at least he'd tried to do something with it. But now he calls him wicked and lazy. Unbelieving, no effort, no commitment. You know, it's the guy's mindset was just out of sight, out of mind. You know, I want, I, want, I want to forget my responsibility about this, so I'll just put it out of the way. Here, here's the, the bottom line on this deal, kind of the point here that under this guy is that, you know, you can't please God by playing it safe in your spiritual walk in life. And there's far too many people sitting in church rows and church services today, you know, or sleeping in bed because they didn't want to get up and lose an hour of sleep because they wanted to play it safe. No risk involved, no commitment involved, no sacrifice, you know. Hey, if I'm not taking any risk, where's my faith in my life? You know? Is it costing me anything? You know, I ask myself the question, have I taken any risk this week? I mean, folks, just simply going out and standing up and letting the world know you're a Christian, that's risky anymore. It was certainly risky in those days. But that's why people won't do it. It's too risky. I, I could lose my job. I could lose my position. I could lose my popularity. Kids know at school, I love Jesus. And, you know, well, maybe you don't love Jesus so much. 
there's, there's this element that it, it, with faith that means you have to step out. And the point where we get to here is, is if I do nothing with my life, if I make no difference as a child of God, then my life is absolutely inexcusable. I'm wicked and I'm a lazy servant. But yet that's where so many are on these days. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what you know, people talk about. You know, one thing I'd like on my tombstone, maybe it just put on mine, at least he tried, all right? <laughs> if he, he fell, but he tried. He fell forward. In other words, he didn't fall backwards. He tried, and there's so many people who won't try. They just kind of freeze up in place and go bury the towel. What's the matter? You know, I might die if I try. Hey, die trying if that's what it takes. And one thing about this guy also you might notice, he's the guy with one talent. And that, that may, you may feel like that's you. I feel like that's me a lot of times. I'm the guy with one talent, you know. But I want to take that talent and do something for the glory of God with it. It's not the guy with five that fails. It's not the guy with two that fails. It's the guy with one. And many times, it's the people who think they have such limited talents, they're the most likely to do nothing. I don't have anything to offer. I don't have this personality of so-and-so. I don't have the education of so-and-so. I don't have the money of so-and-so. And all that, so I just won't do anything. I, I, you know, I just, I'll just settle aside and, you know, and, and, and go to church. I'll, I'll be in church. You know, I meet a lot of Christians who are as boring as dirt. watching paint dry there's no vitality there's no life i mean it's like bill stafford you say you know, a, they look like they've been sucking oatmeal out of coke bottles <laughs> you know the whole thing about baptized in pickle juice kind of thing because they're not doing anything they're playing it safe they don't take any risk in their spiritual life they're not setting any spiritual goals they're not making taking on any challenges they're not going to attempt anything for jesus they just bury it there's lots of places they could serve christ but they just you know they're not good enough for that you know there's thousands of places at believers fellowship they could do something for jesus i mean and they've got skills and they got to some of you could you know computers inside of, we could use you in the areas of of, of of different areas of ministry around here we can all change a diaper in the nursery. We can all help. Amen. You know, I, I, I talked to some of our children's workers the other day. They said, well, you know, we approach a lot of people about help, and here's what we get from them. Oh, well, I've had my kids. I've had my kids. I'm done with that. Well, bless your little pee-picking heart. I hope God calls you to a full-time diaper duty. <laughs> Nobody wants you to run the thing, just wants you to help. Like, we have some Phoebes taking care of it. Amen. But we need to help Phoebes in where they can. There's all kinds of places, but the worst thing you could do is just bury it and say, I'm not going to do anything. Which brings me to this point, and these are all kind of overlapping. One, then I'll operate in faith and not in fear. Fear keeps me from using what God's given me many times. Sometimes, it, and that's just a, another face of pride in many ways, but it's Satan's favorite tactic. You know, just get you afraid of stepping out. You know, this is what he said in verse 26. I was afraid. I went out and I buried, because I was afraid. In fact, there are about three different kinds of fear, and we'll just spend a moment here. One is, is, is the fear of self-doubt. I could never do that. I'm not qualified for that. I couldn't handle that. I don't know what to do with children. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do... And so you don't. Just self-doubt. I, I could never do that. Basically, it's a fear of failure, is it not? The, the, the second kind of fear we, we catalog here is, is self-pity, which is just as bad as self-doubt. You, know, you don't have to be afraid of doing something if God's given you his Holy Spirit. You can pretty much do anything he lays on the table. Amen? Because it's in Christ. If you look at this, there's two characters in the Bible that kind of remind me of this part here about self-pity. There, there was Judas and there's Peter. They both failed the Lord. They both openly failed Christ. One is in remorse and kills himself. The other is in remorse and goes into repentance from there. It makes a difference with the world around him. And that's, you know, really, if you're not being used by, if you're not letting God use you, if you're just kind of a, a, a pew sitter and a warmer, then, then that's, that's where you are. You're just kind of in self-death already. They both denied him, but hey, one went on and made a difference. The, the third aspect of, of these fears is self-consciousness. It kind of gets to what, what, what people think or, you know, or what if I don't perform as well as I should? Because we know that people do in their carnality set back in judgment. You know, we weigh out the service, we weigh out the songs, we weigh out the preacher, we weigh out everybody's actions, everybody's activities, try to second-guess their motives. That's just part of carnality. 
But you can't let other people's carnality keep you from serving God. You know? I'm sure there's a lot of other pastors who could do a lot better job than I do. Who aren't pastoring. <laughs> that aren't doing anything. So, hey, that means I get to. <laughs> I'll just step right up and take that. That means I get to be a part of something. So there's this area we just, well, just because, you know, you can't do anything spectacular, because you're not as, you know, an orator, you're not this or you're not that, or you can't sing, or you ain't got ten talents, you ain't got five talents, all you got is one talent. Verse 24, the man who received one talent came and said, Master, I knew you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not gathered seed, which wasn't true. The master wasn't hard at all. We, we know who the master is, don't we? The master has blessed him by just, I mean, how can you say, here's a thousand dollars. Oh, you're such a hard man. <laughs> oh, the Lord is so hard to serve the Lord. Here's eternal life. Here's salvation from judgment and death and hell and the grave. Oh, the Lord's so hard to live for Jesus. <laughs> no investment here, amen. Just absolutely lost. The, you can't operate. In faith. You operate, I mean, you can't operate in fear. You operate in faith. The sixth thing, um, I have to understand the use it or lose it principle. This is pretty simple. He says, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Now you say, well, that doesn't sound very fair, does it? No, that doesn't sound fair. But we're not talking about fair. That's a worldly terminology. We're talking about right and righteous and justice. You know? Yeah, well, it just looks to me like the rich are getting richer and the talented are getting more talents. Got only one talent. I've been taking it away from him. Let me clarify. Who's the master? All right, your heavenly father, Lord Jesus Christ, he's the master, right? And he has the right to take away anything that I don't use to invest for him. All right? Anything he's given me that I don't use for his glory, he has the right to take it away. Why? It's his. It belongs to him. So I have to understand this use it or lose it mentality. All right? And by the way, before I even start on number seven, that's true about everything in life. If you get real lazy and don't use your muscles, what happens? Atrophy. They get, you start losing it. How about your mind? You know, people's minds stay sharp the longest people continue to use their mind. They read, they study the scriptures, they stay sharp in the word of God, and their faculties stay longer. Because they're using it, and they're, 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 they're using what God's given to them. If you refuse it, I mean, it's like a talent. Asking these musicians, if they quit playing or, or singing, what happens to the, the vocal muscles? What happens to the, the, the memory, the uh, mind action between, you know, the hand-eye, mind-eye coordination, the fingers and instruments or whatever? You lose it. So you keep using what God's given to you. And God blesses you with more of it. By the way... Say, brother, I just don't have time to serve the Lord. There's your error. You don't have time because you don't serve the Lord. Let me say that again. You don't have time because you don't serve the Lord. You'd serve the Lord more, give him more time, guess what you get? If that's not true, you know, then the Bible's lying to us. Because the Bible says, whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. So if I sow whatsoever time, guess what I get? Time. If I don't, guess what I don't get? I don't just, I, 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 it's pretty simple. Use it or lose it. And the seventh is this. I comprehend spiritual compensation principles, which kind of, again, laps over that. This principle of spiritual composition, uh, of, of compensation, says just the opposite of the use it or lose it. The, the, it's, it's this principle. If I do use it, I will gain from it. If I use it wisely, I will be rewarded. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few. I'll put you in charge of many. You see? See, well, I want to be in charge of more. You don't use what you got. You're not faithful. Faithful in little, the Bible says, you'll be faithful over much. Faithful in little, master over much. Not faithful in little, not master over anything. So we have to get back to understanding, hey, everything that I have, belongs to the Lord. And the Lord says about everything I have in Luke 6, give and it shall be given unto you. 
pressed down, shaken together, running over. Whatever I give to the Lord, whatsoever man soweth, that will he also. It's this compensation. Now, if you look at, at this passage carefully, just in the context of what he's saying here, are these faithful servants to the Lord. He, he talks about three rewards. One is this affirmation, which I think is, is probably one of the best. You know, I, I, I love being appreciated, don't you? We all love that. Well, where, where's the highest affirmation you can get? It's from God himself when he says, you're doing good. You're doing good. You are doing with what I put in your hands, what you're, sp good job. You're trying, you're moving forward. You're making investments with your time and your talents. And your you're, you're making a difference. The second area here has to do with the reward is, is promotion. He says, I'm gonna put you in charge of more. I'm always amazed people wanna be in charge of more, but never will take responsibility over a little. Wicked and lazy servant. I'm saying that to myself as well, don't take offense. If we won't take responsibility, why should we sit back and say, well, I just need the Lord to do more? What I, you know what I'm responsible for and what you're responsible for? We're responsible for the depth of our ministry. So I'm going to take it deeper. I'm going to go higher with the Lord. That's what I'm responsible for. The Lord's responsible for the breadth of my ministry. The impact of what area, where he wants it. That's his responsibility. I just make sure my ministry is committed to him. My life's committed to him. Whatever it is, God will expand it as he sees fit with promotion. That's his responsibility. Mine is to invest where I'm supposed to invest. But it's a sacrifice. No, it's an investment. Celebration is, is I, I, everybody loves a party, amen? It's going to, it's going to be the ultimate party one day, amen? Come and share your master's happiness. Now, there wasn't any happiness from the master, obviously, when he's a wicked and lazy servant. But the master is exceedingly pleased. Now, last week, remember that theme from Hebrews 11? It was those people whom God was not ashamed to be called their God. This is those people. These, these are the ones he's talking about here. People who, who said, hey, I'm going to be a part of what God wants. Here's the seven principles for those who didn't hear it the first time. You know, I'll take ownership. Second one has to do with respons I'll take responsibility. Third has to do with my accountability. God, I'm going to use what God's given me to use. Fourth has to do with utilization. I, it's wrong to bury my talents. I'm going to do, use what God gave me. I'm not going to live my life based on fear. It's a snare. I'm going to live my life based, based on faith. And it's a use it or lose it. God's blessed me. I'm just going to use it. The, you know, I don't want to lose it. And the last was compensation. He rewards the faithful. I love this, 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 this quote from Jim Elliott, who died on the mission field, by the way. He says, he is no fool who gives up what he can't keep for that which he cannot lose. There's a lot of people giving their lives up for stuff they can't keep. They're getting a name. They're getting notoriety. They want to be the next American Idol, you know, they, whatever it might be. That's the mindset of our whole culture, is it not? We want people to worship us, notice us. Recognize. So we build our little kingdoms up. A kingdom you're not going to be able to keep. It's only one king. Why, why are you wasting? You say, Brother Joe, I, I have a career. We, we, yeah, we have careers. We have responsibilities in life. We fulfill those responsibilities. I, I, I run across a lot of people who say, you know, I'm bored. I can't stand my job. I hate what I do. Let me tell you this. If you're trying to find satisfaction, life, peace, and joy from what you do, you made the first mistake. It was only found in Christ. Now, he can give me the capacity if I do what I do for him to make it count. That's why the Bible says everything you do, do it as unto the Lord. There's a lot of people just empty in their spiritual walk in life. And it's not because they're empty in the physical realm of life. They're doing a lot of stuff for, 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 for the world and in their life and in their little circle of influence. But, you know, they just... They're not investing their life in other people and things that are eternal and things that are, are righteous. I'm not saying that your job, your job can be a righteous thing if you're doing what you do for God. But, you know, I, I have a little chart here. I think I showed this on one Wednesday night before. Where I talked about, let's, let's look at where we are. And this is in the context, you know, of, of the four questions that I ask, you know, where am I and where am I headed and what's hindering me and, you know, what's the next step? But I want to break it down this morning into three little simple areas. We just call them time, talent, and treasure, you know. Where am I in my talent? God's given you unique personality, unique resources, unique opportunities. Uh, he made you in a certain way. What are you doing with that? You know, what, are you, what are you doing with that? 
You might put a little X on there of, of what you're doing. Where, where are you in that, you know? Uh, and, and then put a zero where you think you need to be. Where, 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 where are you going to take this thing? You know, am I, am I using what God's given me at all? But Joe, I am, I am handy in certain areas. I have abilities in certain areas. I have certain skill sets in certain areas. How much of that is used for God? You know? I praise God we have a, a good group of people around here who realize that. I mean, you know, we got some guys, you know, I, I can't stand to be around Don Morris. He's, he's one of the most talented guys I know. I got, he, he's terrible with a calculator. I mean, terrible good, you know, that way. Not a power tool in the world he can't operate. Drives tractors, all that other good stuff. It's just disgusting to be around him. <laughs> Say that in humor. Yeah. But you know what? I see, well, hey, you know what? I pull up here to see Don. He's an executive with Oakham. He's out here riding his tractor mowing 10 acres of property back here in the heat of the sun in August. You know? I see a guy like, like Brian who's skilled and, and, and with, with cameras and video and stuff, does it for a living, also transfers it to jobs. So many people around here. Jennifer's a cop. She's back there every Sunday running the sound system. You know? So be careful. She can shoot you if I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> And, there, and I, I hate starting mentioning the name because there's so many of you like that that are doing, so, I mean, lift leaders and teachers and nursery workers and volunteers and heirs, but there's so many more that could be volunteers. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a ministry kind of fair, if you want to call it that. Well, there'll be tables out in the lobby where we need help in different areas of ministry. There's no reason we shouldn't have lines at those tables. Hey, I can help with children about every six weeks. It doesn't bother me. You know? Praise God, we have, we have food pantries and clothes pantries and nursing home ministries, all kinds of stuff going around. You can do something for God. Amen. We have outreach ministries and evangelism ministries. There's a place for everybody to serve. And everybody's been called to serve. And everybody's going to be held responsible for if they served or not. Well, Brother Joe, I just like hearing, you know, I've done my service time. Use it or lose it. Hate to see all that gone to waste. Keep the investments fresh. Amen. So what about that? Where, where do you measure on that? Where do you want to go with that? Say, I certainly want to take it to the next step. How about in the context of your time? And again, this is where, you know, uh, if you're going to be dynamic in your spiritual life, this is investment number one many times, isn't it? Not? I mean, we've got to give our time to the Lord. Uh, what if we tithe our time like we tithe our money? You know what that means if I tithe my time? And tithing is just a standard. We know that's, that's under the law, but we also know it's under grace as a symbol and as a standard, as a good starting place, right? That's, we have these types and symbols from the Old Testament. So don't say, oh, that's, Old Te that's Old Testament. It's a good, God's giving you a very clear word from where you ought to be starting at. I like what Manly Bees used to say. He said, that's just baby giving if you're a tither. All right. Where do you want to be? You know, there's a, so, but with your time, what if we, we took, well, it's what? 24 times 7 is 168. You're the calculator over there. <laughs> 168 hours a week. What if I give 16 hours a week to the Lord? Well, let's see. I come to church about an hour and a half. Uh, come to Wednesdays for some of us. Uh, well, don't count the hour and a half if you show up here after the welcome guest, all right? You, I mean, first thing you've got to do is get to come into church on time. Start with. I mean, no reason we ought to not have half the church filled when, you know, you, you're a wicked and lazy servant. You used to get over it and get to church. Amen. Get on time. Amen. 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 Are we having fun this morning or not? Some of you aren't enjoying this more than others, I know. Some of you are enduring it, but praise the Lord, press on with me, all right? But what if I gave just part of my time to the Lord, just 16 hours? Okay, let's say four hours for church this week. Uh, that leaves me about 12 more. Well, let's say I spend 30 minutes a day just in quiet time. And I don't do it on Sunday because I'm at church, all right? So that's six days, 30 minutes, that's three hours. I'm up to seven hours. Oh... Hey! No. I'm, I'm giving you time to figure your schedule, all right, while I'm working on mine. How many hours this week, in reality? You need more time? Give some more time to the Lord. Where would you like to be? You say, well, I don't even give 30 minutes to the Lord a day. Then where do you want to be? Well, you know where you are now. Where are you going? It says some discipline in our life. Let's, let's give something to God in our time. Let's see what God does for us. That's one of those spots you're supposed to clap. <laughs> I 
Now for the easy one. Your treasure. Where you are, where you want to be. You, you want to be in the nursery all your giving life? Yeah. And I praise the Lord because there's so many that, the reason we're debt free today as a church, because so many have gone over and above and go beyond that 10%. But where are you? And I think it's no matter where we are and how far we advance, we just say, I'm never satisfied. Uh, you know, we've talked about R.G. Letourneau and J.C. Penney and all these guys who said, you know, their goal, they had a goal, they knew where they were, they knew where they wanted to be. They said, my goal is when I get down the road here, I want to be given 90% and keeping 10%. Some of you are about giving 10%. All right? You know, why are you grabbing about that? Because you still think it's yours. As long as you think it's yours, you've missed the mark. Where, where, do you, where do you want to be in all, in all these areas? You know, because if this principle is true, if I invest my life and God returns, it's this principle of compensation that it comes back to me, hey, then I start to start using everything I am for the glory of God in my life. Where are you? Where are you headed? What do you want God to do? We want to take it higher? Then let's, let's mean business. We want to take it deeper? Then let's mean business. And it's, to mean business means I'm willing to really do a close examination of where I am, where I want to be, where's I am at, how's it going to get there, what's it going to take. And it would, it would do well to, to, to just take the time and outside this service and get along with God and just say, oh, here's, Lord, here's where I am in all these three areas, my talents, my time, my treasure. And Lord, I, need what, I, I see what I need to do. And I'm going to make myself available, you know, for serving you in whatever way I, that you lead me to do. And more of that will come up over the next couple of weeks if you come back. <laughs> Let's stand. You know, these, these messages, they're good inventories for all of us in which we all...